Alternative 40K Network presents Art of War. Art of War. Strategy and tactics. Discussions with the best players on the planet. Now your host, Nick Nanavati. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Art of War podcast. This week, we're talking to one of my good friends in Warhammer, the boy king himself, the champion of the people from the Warhammer World Championships, making it all the way to the finale through the midnight round of of Servo Skulls into the round three versus Manny Shima. We have John Lennon, the man with the Space Marines, the man with the Battle Force, the man who could take Marnius Calgar all the way to the top tables. To here to tell us about his experience. So in part one of this two-part show, we're going to get to know John. We've already met him. He's been on the show plenty of times, but we're going to get to know him again. We're going to get to know his army. We're going to get to know his experience at Worlds and how did he come up with this magical army, which I heard he only got three reps on before the World Championship itself, and he did so well with it. Then in part two, we're going to talk about the actual games on the tabletop. Where did the models go? Where did the models move? What strats were used? What was the strategy? How did John... Go, I don't even know how many games of Warhammer he won and won at the World Championships of Warhammer. John, how are you doing? I'm great. Appreciate uh, that kind intro. Uh, I'm doing very well. Uh, life is busy, but life is good. Life is busy, but life is good. Isn't that the time of the year for everybody? But uh, the kindness of that intro was entirely warranted, John. You have uh, not only performed super well on the tabletop, your sportsmanship throughout the championships was amazing as well. And uh, to be on such a stage when you're doing that is just really, really cool because it affects so many people. So I'd love to see that. You did a great job. Thank you. Very welcome. But what we're here to talk about is the world championships. What was your experience like leading up to worlds? You know, everyone is trying to tech for each other. It's like the most challenging singles tournament around. What was your preparation? Yeah, absolutely. So my preparation going in was that I, I figured this was going to be an event like no other. And from experience, I've played at a couple different, like, invitational slash, you know, I think I've been to four different events that have advertised themselves as the hardest event ever. Um, uh, But I I figured this one was actually going to be, and my experience at all those events has been throughout the years, that people either bring the absolute best stuff in the game, or they bring something that is specifically built to play against the best stuff in the game. And those are, that's basically what everyone takes. So in the current meta, I, I thought it was a fairly well-established Eldar and Chaos Space Marines on top, with Votan as like a not distant, but distinctly third. And so I figured that there's just going to be a lot of those, and a lot of people trying to beat those. And whenever I'm going to an event with a lot of top players, I don't like to run something meta. Um, my experience, because I've been doing this a while, has been that when top players play other top players, if it's a defined matchup, you know, then maybe the person who has the most reps wins it or whatever. But uh, if there's ever a case where one player has an unconventional list and one player has a practice advantage, that often makes a difference in uh, in kind of a top player matchup. And so I kind of resolved going into this that I was going to play something counter meta. I wanted to play something weird. I didn't want to be another meta player, but I also wanted to do my best to do as well as possible. So I wanted to take something as competitive as I thought I reasonably could. That makes a lot of sense. And I really like the way you broke that up down into terms of do you play the meta army or the counter meta army? Is there an emotional side to that? Or is that just like a calculated, this is my advantage for this tournament? Oh, there's totally an emotional side to that. Um, there's, so I'm going to be honest, a real part of it is also hedging your bets because I knew going in that this was going to be an event where everyone there was good. And at a given event, usually about half of the tournament finishes below the halfway point. That's how that's how math works. So I didn't want to take a meta army and then do poorly. And if you take an off meta army, you kind of get a little bit of a buy. Where if you do something weird and it doesn't work, you it's like, eh, no big deal, right? You know, I was just I was just playing Marnie and Scalgar. I was being silly. Um and so it kind of gives you a bit of a safety net because there, there's a very real thought going into this of like, yes, yeah, some several world class players are going to lose four or five games. Like a lot of world class players are going to lose four, five, six, seven games. Um, and I think the so, reality of that hit in the moment at Worlds when it was like the end of day one and everyone kind of thought, OK, I'll get through day one. It's two games, whatever. Um, and then. You know, 75% of the field was already eliminated at the end of day one, you know, 
So when you think of it in terms of, of that, there was a big wake up call to most of the attendants. Did you have that going in or was that kind of your realization like live? Oh, I, I very much knew in advance that this was going to be a bloodbath. I, I've been to enough super dense events that I know that good players still lose games because someone has to. Um, and so for me, it was a little bit of I want to go off meta to, you know, both get myself a better chance, I thought, into good players who haven't practiced into me while I've hopefully practiced into their army. And then also, like, I didn't want to just, I didn't want to switch to a meta army that's off-brand for me and do poorly. So I, I found that I'm, I'm whenever I play something that's out of my normal armies, like whenever I borrow an army from the house, whenever I'm like, because I've kind of got the armies that I actually own and paint and play and enjoy. And every once in a while, I'm lured by the temptations of nine void weavers or six raiders full of witches and racks and stuff like that. And and generally, I find that if I take those armies and then lose a game, I am unhappy for the rest of the tournament because I don't actually enjoy playing the army. I just want to win. And so I was very resolved to not switch to an army that I don't enjoy playing because it's so real that you're going to lose at some point. Like, yeah. literally no one in the room made it out undefeated. No one went undefeated. That's a really great point. Like, in a hall of amazing players, not a single person went undefeated. That That is the truth to be told. So you play off-meta stuff. You have a large collection of armies that are in your repertoire. And if you're resolving not to play Eldar or CSM, neither of which are in your, your army repertoire, um, your spectrum of availability is kind of enormous. And, you know, if you think about what your history is as a player— you're, you're notoriously a Tyrion player. They just got their codex. They're, you know, you won a GT with them. You did very well at Tampa with them. Um, you know, all signs point to the bugs. And then surprise Space Marines. What's that about? Yeah, so for me, it was all about I wanted the element of surprise. I wanted to show up to the table, play against a great WTC caliber player, and do the quick spiel of, hey, have you played against this army before? And I wanted them to say no. It's really... I, I like my Space Marines. I've been enjoying playing my Tyranids. Um, I, I found that Tyranids had a couple of practical limitations that are very, they're very good. I think Tyranids are much better than the public perception or their win rate would indicate. I think they're much better than that. But I, I have, I've played enough games with Tyranids that I've experienced their limits. And I thought that their limit was something that I could kind of plan around in a normal singles tournament, but I thought I wouldn't be able to get away with here because... My assumption going in was that I was going to hit a higher density of the top armies than normal. Like, if I go to a normal six-round tournament, it is fairly likely that I play against a Chaos Space Marine or an Eldar if I'm doing well. At Worlds, I thought I was going to play against two or three of each. Because, you know, normally if, if you go to a GT six rounds, you probably don't play against three Chaos Space Marines. Right. right. And so I mean... it's like, yeah... Maybe I don't have a great matchup into Chaos Space Marines with Tyranids, because that, that was what I'm, my opinion was the hardest matchup. I was like, hey, this isn't a good matchup, but if I play Chaos Space Marines once at a GT, I can maybe scrape together a win. Maybe well, I don't. Yeah, right? Lose. A, a like, but, Crucible, local major tournament. You went 6-0, playing Quentin Zeldar, playing my CSM, scraping together wins in those games. You dominated me, but he, he scraped against Quentin. And... You know, the plan worked. You basically won the tournament that way. But when every round is a scrape fest against the world's best players, you know, that's not really a great plan. So I totally feel that. Um, yeah. What pushed you to Space Marines? Space Marines were brand new. And therefore, even though Space Marines are popular, because there were seven new detachments coming out at once, I figured that people wouldn't have a lot of Space Marine reps. Uh, Space Marines are my second largest collection. It's an army that I really enjoy playing. Um, Space Marines and Tyranids are traditionally the armies that I've played the most. Um, and they got a brand new book, so I was excited about new stuff. I figured people didn't have practice into new stuff. And by going through the various detachments, I thought that I found a gem that people weren't talking about as much as they should have been. And that was obviously the Vanguard detachment. Right. I read the Vanguard detachment. You played me in one practice game for the stream. And, uh, you know, I saw the potential in those rules, but... One of the things that was so real about Worlds and the Space Marine Codex's release is that, like you said, no one has the time to really put the, the reps in against it and really understand what it's truly doing. Um, but at the same time, who has the time to put the reps in with it? How many reps did you get with this army going into it? Um, so I played 
one game with a Dark Angel Vanguard, just as like, a, hey, let's see what the detachment does, and that made me like it. With Ultramarine Vanguard, I managed to play four games asterisk when one of those games we only played turn one because it was TTS and one of us had to go. I think someone had a, a child-related uh, situation. So I played four games, but one of them was bottom of one only. So I think I played 13 turns of Warhammer. And did you you felt confident after that to just make the jump? You know, I can play this army um, even with this few reps into the field. What? How is that's a big jump? And usually, John, you're the type of player who preaches play what you know. So, like, you know, why not play the Tyranids? We've kind of gone on through why not play the Tyranids, but why break the mantra of play what you know? Yeah. So I I know that's something that I, I advocate for a lot. It, it was that it really. By the last rep, it felt like it was clicking, which is good because the last rep was after I submitted the list, so I really needed it to click because uh, I was I was not as confident when I submitted the list as when I ended up playing games with it afterwards. Um, but I, I really felt like um, it was okay to go a little bit off of normal because I figured good players would have Tyranid reps. And good players with reps into Tyranids is very difficult for Tyranids. And so I thought that having a rep advantage on Tyranids would be canceled out by the fact that my opponents would often have rep advantages. Like they'd also have reps. And I figured if it's a zero, if it's a low rep into low rep, the advantage will be me because I've spent a lot more time thinking about it. Whereas if it's high rep into high rep, the difference starts to get a little smaller. That's definitely true. And were your practice games actually into Chaos Space Marines and Eldar when you were testing um, a few games? Yeah, I got I got some practice into Eldar, enough to know that it was a winnable game. I got one practice game into Chaos Space Marines. I actually got wrecked, but it was very informative. And I felt like the, the me getting tabled was not what had to happen every time. But it would, like it you learned from it to how to not get tabled in the future. Exactly, yeah. It was like a, as I, I made mistakes, I got punished hard for them, and I felt like I was in control of the game for three turns, and then it spiraled. And so I just had to figure out how to extend that control a little bit longer. I'm so excited, John. You're like, you like you can tell you do this for a living because that's literally what we're going to be talking about in part two of this Patreon podcast. So you can subscribe there on AOW40K.com. We're going to break down all of John's learnings and how he actually moved this army. So apparently you can really screw the pooch for CSM, but we'll, we'll talk more about that. <laughs> okay, so we submitted the army and then let's go live like a couple days later. Was the feeling like regret, anxiety, confidence? What was this like? Uh, definitely confidence. I thought that Chaos Space Marines was my worst matchup on paper of the armies that would be commonly seen. And I ended up in a pod that has zero Chaos Space Marines in it. Um, I ended up in a very weird pod where uh, I, there were only two Eldar in my pod, and then there was zero Chaos Space Marines. So despite me being worried about the top armies, because obviously they're the top armies for a reason, I kind of had a very realistic win path out of my pod where I only had to play against one or two Eldar at most. And then like probably like realistically, you know, you don't have to play everyone in the pod. So you probably only have to play one Eldar. And then a bunch of like good but off meta armies like Tyranids and Tau and Votan and Death Watch and Drukari, like everything was in my pod is everything but Chaos Space Marines was kind of weird. Um so I felt fairly good. There was a lot of good players in my pod, uh, like Innis and Josh Roberts and many, many more, because everyone in the pod is good, it turns out. But I, I I felt that it was very much in my grasp to win the game, to win the pod. It was very much something that I could do, which was was nice because I got to really just focus on a couple things in practice. And by practice I mean like reading and thinking about not actually playing. And it was uh, really kinda, fun okay. being a, a person at the event because there's like little pool betting pools being like who do you think is going to win the pod who do you think is going to win the pod and we had like over unders and stuff john i'll have you know that you were probably the most controversial person whether or not they were going to win their pod people didn't know what your army did people didn't know how well you were going to do it was it was a fun time mm -hmm. oh i um i i got to see that as well because everyone I'm, I'm sad i didn't get in on any of the betting pools i really wish i'd made some predictions um although in hindsight my predictions would have been mediocre at best i the ones I had in my head, most of them did not work out well. <laughs> it go, is a hard three. thing to do, predicting that field. Yeah, I think I only got three of the eight pods right on picking the winner. Um, but, um, yeah, it, it was it was very, very fun being there in the atmosphere. But uh, I, I felt I had a good shot at the pod. There was enough, there was plenty of good players, so it was never a guarantee. It was at no point was it like it taken for granted. Oh, I'll just win the pod. That's not real. Um, 
No, but, you can't go in with that kind of overconfidence. But just, you know, it's good to have a confidence about it. If you go in being fearful of your pod, you are probably not walking out of your pod a winner. Yeah, I, I went in very much with the mindset of, okay, if I do my job, nothing goes weird. I have the, I'll have the opportunity to play for a win. And that's all I can ask for. Right. So let's talk about your actual army here. Because you had quite uh, a different army. I don't think anyone else brought Vanguard Space Marines and played it anywhere similar to how you did. Um, if they did, I missed it. But uh, you took it super far. What was the actual list you took? All right. So let's hit the list top to bottom. So this is going to be uh, Marius Calgar as my warlord with his two victor scarred. An Apothecary Biologist with an enhancement that gives his unit the ability to infiltrate. It's called the Blade Driven Deep. And those two characters are going to be attached to six Bolt Storm Aggressors. Then I have Uriel Ventress. Uriel Ventress is going to attach to a unit of four Company Heroes. And a Calidus Assassin is my last character. Then we've got three units of five Scouts. And two units of three Eradicators. Follow that up with... 15 Inceptors. 12 of those Inceptors have Plasma, uh, two units of six, and three of them have Bolter option. Then we round the list out with uh, six Centurion Devastators. They have Laz Cannons and Centurion Missile Launchers. And that is the list. It seems so unassuming, but it's definitely obviously tricky in the way that you don't understand. It's a Vanguard detachment. It's got these Inceptors, a lot of Inceptors, small Eradicators, Centurions, Marty's Calgar, and these dudes. How does it all come together, John? In your words, how would you play this army? <clears throat> yeah, so this army is very reserve-heavy and very teleport-heavy. Um, I suppose I should start by just rattling off a couple of the key aspects of the Vanguard. Because it's a new detachment, there's a couple things that I actually use. And so this army is harder to shoot at range because it's minus one to hit from a certain distance, 12 inches, gets cover. And it's got a, a very good number of stratagems. And one of them is the ability to go back into reserves. So I start a lot in reserves. Then I have one CP put a unit into reserves. And on top of that, four of the data sheets I have on the table, being the Calidus and three scouts, have a data sheet ability to go into reserves. So this is a... It's a swarm of bees. It is very hard to attack the center because the center doesn't exist. The center leaves at the end of your fight phase. Um, then with the reserves, it is something that you always have to be screening. But between Inceptors and Space Marines, I'm very good at clearing chaff. And therefore, screens are usually in short supply by the time we are actually developing the game. So the way that this army plays is it's a scattering of infiltrating, scouting, teleporting, deep striking stuff that is always working around the table and trying to be in the best position. Uh, there's a 1 CP stratagem that boosts my damage output by giving me plus 1 ballistic skill and AP from over 12 inches away. But beyond that, I don't really have any damage buffs beyond just generic Space Marines. So the way that I describe this army is that it is a Space Marine detachment that provides a little bit of defense against shooting. It provides a lot of random tricks and redeploy. And it's all about putting Space Marine data sheets in the best possible position. It's not about making Space Marine data sheets better. It's about the Space Marine data sheet is just a Space Marine, but it is in the exact optimal spot as often as I want. And so as long as I, the, the player, get to position the models correctly, I usually can get good results. Because I would rather have a Space Marine in the right place than a better Space Marine that can't get into position. So philosophically, you'd like the Space Marine stats, but the applicability of the Move 6 profile or whatever is the challenge. But then Inceptors obviously just show up right next to you and blast whatever they want. Any chapter can take Inceptors, though. So beyond that, it's the going up and coming down from reserves, which you're really liking. And that allows you to position Centurions around the table. What, why is that so much more powerful than any of the other options? Yeah, so Centurions are a great long-range shooting option that moves four inches. And so they're, they're a very good output for their points, but they're very slow. And it's kind, of like a, it's kind of like an overpriced obliterator without all of the special rules. And where it's awesome, and they get Deep Strike because I took Uriel Ventress. Uriel Ventress gives one infantry unit the Deep Strike roll at the beginning of the game. It is the Centurions 24-7. It is always the Centurions. Um, and so... Because I have that ability to teleport them and deep strike them, it means they can actually shoot. Centurions are traditionally a unit that will go in reserve, 
arrive, shoot one thing very hard, and then your opponent is going to realize, hey, they move four inches, right? And they're just going to like spend 30 seconds pre-measuring the fact that a centurion can barely move through a wall, and they'll just leave. And just then you don't get to shoot your 350 point unit. So it's a data sheet that doesn't work in most attachments, and so it doesn't get taken. But space marines have a bit of a damage problem without them. So I was trying to solve the damage problem of space marines, because I, as a player, I hate getting stat checked. If I lose a five turn game of 40k, I lose a five turn game of 40k, but I hate getting stat checked. And so, so what, I wanted to keep that offense up. How hard are these centurions shooting me? Um, if I buff them entirely, and to be clear, that is spend a CB, they are plus one ballistic skill, plus one AP from over 12 inches, and they'll be able to teleport into line of sight every turn. What that looks like is it's six last cannon shots that are ballistic skill two, strength 12, AP four, twin linked damage D6 plus one. They reroll ones to hit all the time, and they reroll full hits against object against units on objective markers. So they are very, very accurate. And because they have an eight rerolls built in, they don't soak up the oath of moment. They don't need oath of moment to activate. Like they really centurions never really bother shooting the oath target. So, wow, so you're almost replicating the oath effect by having centurions who just have almost a hundred percent hit rate and then twin length on their las cannons. And then you also have both of the moment for, say, your aggressors or something, your inceptors. Exactly. But the last cannon is not even their best gun, because the, their best gun is the Centurion Missile Launcher, which is D3 shots, again, this is after the stratagem, at Ballistic Skill 2, Strength 9, AP 3, Damage D3, and it's Blast. And they still get the same rerolls. They're not twin-linked, but if you are shooting into a blastable target, then that adds up very quickly because each model has the blast weapon, so it'll be plus six for every increment of blast that you have. And at, again, plus six skill two rerolling ones, strength nine AP three, it's very good at popping toughness nine vehicles. It's actually very respectable at killing toughness ten up, but it's not insane. But AP three adds up, and wounding on fives will get you places because of the volume. And then as soon as someone has an increment of blast, the gun gets radically more effective. Wow. So there's uh, there's two different profiles on the Centurion, and just blasting you. And what's the range on this other gun? Uh, 36 on the missile, 48 on the last cannon. Yeah, so it's it's from across court. There's not, like, if you have a nice clean angle down the line of sight on the edge, edge of the table, there's typically not terrain. You can really get to work on somebody. I, I can see it. So you have Centurions bouncing around, going up and coming down, I assume. Is that like an every turn kind of thing? Yeah, the Centurions are by far my best single activation, so they're always the first thing I check. If they have the ability to walk for and shoot something, I'll probably just take that. But they are by far the unit that I spend the stride on the most often. Nice. And then you have all these Inceptors threatening on turn two and turn three, just absolute mayhem in your opponent's back lines. And then you have this Aggressor unit with Marnie's Calgary. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so I know we haven't even mentioned them, right? So this is a 10-man aggressor unit because it's six aggressors, an apothecary, Marnius Calgar, and two Victor Scars. So it ends up as a 10-man unit. And that 10-man unit has infiltrate. So this is very much kind of part of the theory of the army, which is that most times when people play against a reserve-heavy army, if they see that there's a ton of stuff off the board, they're going to think, oh, let me just run straight at you because you're not going to shoot me turn one. And Calgar infiltrating in the middle is a very powerful deterrent because he has very large hands and he wants to get them on you. So this is a very strong counterpunch unit. Calgar provides great value. He gives me a CP, and my stratagems are the best part of the detachment, so I need the CP. And he gives his unit advance and charge, advance and shoot, fallback charge, fallback shoot. So he becomes a shield that really doesn't get tagged and projects a very nice threat range. And so he kind of becomes the thing that I keep in between my backfield and my opponent, because while my backfield can leave at any point, I like to have a backfield so that I'm scoring points with it and have a staging point. And so Calgar is a great midfield threat. He can box over the center objectives. He can threaten to go deep if my opponent's disrespectful. 10 Gravis Marine bodies are relatively tough. Because they have two Victrix Guard in there, there's a two-up save in the unit, which means that I can tank on the Victrix Guard, pop Armor of Contempt, and be actually very tough into the right profile. 
because the unit infiltrates, it's almost always going to find itself in cover. And so you can end up with a, a unit that is much harder to kill than standard aggressors. It doesn't hit as hard in shooting because it's not Gladius, but it still hits hard enough that you don't take it lightly. And it's a very dynamic threat that's very hard to pin down, much like the rest of the army, because it's the easiest thing to catch, but it is tough to kill and it can always fall back, advance, and activate. Therefore, it's actually hard to shut down. And you don't want to just consult it into it because it, it still is an aggressor, you know, with Calgar. Very nice. So you basically have scouts for scoring, Calgar's assassin for more jumping up and down and scoring stuff. This infiltrating unit to basically put 10 very durable but threatening and dynamic space marines, as you put it, between your opponent's army and this, this barely held together backfield. And then you have centurions and deep strike, all these plasma scepters and deep strike. And then every turn, you're just threatening different spots on the board with those centurions. And you can kind of box in the middle over the center objectives with this aggressor unit. Is that kind of the game plan? That is, but there is one small thing to note, which is that the centurions like to deploy on the board. And that's actually because of a ruling that came down for the Atlanta event, which is that if a unit has the deep strike rule, and on the top of turn one, it goes into reserves, then it can actually arrive on the bottom of turn one with deep strike. Kind of oh, like wow. how this assassin can top of turn one, go up, and then on turn one, arrive. And so you can do the same thing with the centurions. And this is a very powerful deterrent. Because what I find is that, again, when you have too much of your army in reserves, people will try to disrespect you and they'll try to run at you. Again, that is my favorite. That is my least favorite way to lose a game of Warhammer, just getting run at and overwhelmed. So the Centurion's deploying means that if I go second, which I'm normally okay with, although an infiltrating Calgar unit doesn't mind going first, um, but if I go second and my opponent does get aggressive, I can kind of put the pause and say, hey, just remember that this Centurion unit can immediately pick up a teleport and get line of fire. And so you're not actually safe if you just push at me aggressively. So it means that if someone, it means that someone can't just say, well, you won't have reserves this turn, so I might as well not screen. You have to screen every single turn. Yeah, so that's a huge factor when you're playing against this kind of deep striking reserve pressure army. Screens are like your premium resource, and armies right now take a varying amount of some are screens. Some take none, some take lots, um, but no matter how many you take, they're going to be stressed for all five turns of the game. And, you know, people playing screens around, I have to screen turn two and turn three, and I need a set amount of screens to do that, and if I have more, that's good. And you're stressing that out. You can target them really effectively. And then what do you typically target with this army, and what kind of ranges and, and threats do you do? Because your army is so dynamic. Um, I want to keep matchup-specific stuff in for part two, but generally, what's kind of the guidelines for attack here? Yeah, so the guidelines in general are that I'm not trying to win this game on turn two or three. This army has a very high damage drop turn, and so there's always that temptation, which is something that I, I did in practice games and I found was very rarely the right call. It is very tempting to say, wow, I could shoot them with my entire Space Marine army on turn two. That's going to hurt so bad. And yes, it does hurt very badly to get shot by this entire army at once. But my game plan is usually... Unless I am in a very bad spot, which I try to navigate around, I'm usually just trying to prolong the game and play a long game, not a, not a short game. And so my target priority isn't any one thing. My target priority is to pre-measure, find what my opponent can interact with me with, and kill that. I'm not trying to kill the high damage dealers. Um, I'm obviously going to try to kill objective holders when I can, screens when I can. But my favorite target is the one that I can kill without getting hit back. Because I'm never going to be out of position. If you put something in a far corner and I have to go hunt it down, I will because the unit that hunts it down will then just teleport away. You know, sometimes like people will put something like a lone operative in a corner and say, yeah, anything that goes for the lone operatives out of the game, that's not true for my army. If there's five scouts behind a wall, I will send something to kill them, not be in position to do anything else, and they'll just teleport away. And then it's the same thing, you know, if... If I can hit one screening unit from an angle that is safe, I have absolutely shot the full... I have teleported the full centurion brick to see five space marines and nothing else, and I just kill them a thousand times over and just say, cool, one resource down, you don't hit me back, let's try again next turn. 
Nice. So it's that slow death, death by thousand cuts. And basically, once they're out of resources, that's when you hammer them for a drop turn. Exactly. I, I try to prolong the, the heavy hitting turn as late as possible. And again, if someone is really applying high pressure, maybe I'll go early. If someone is really running up a scoreboard, maybe I'll go early. But in it's general, true. I would prefer to wait as long as I can. Very interesting because you've been able to really match your play style. I know for years of knowing you coming on the podcast talking about it, you like to play this more prolonged patient game where you, you lure your opponent in and then basically kill them kind of thing. Uh, I see you brought that to your space rooms, which I think is super cool, especially with the way your list looks on paper. It very much looks like it's trying to basically table you turn one, turn two, very fast paced Warhammer. And on that note, Warhammer right now is a fast-paced game. Like people are done by turn two a lot of the time. Like you get run over by CSM or World Eaters, some of these factions, Eldar with their Night Spinners and Inkhorn can end at turn one. And you're really prolonging it instead of trying to play all five turns. Very counterintuitive approach. And I know it goes in line with your off-meta ideas here, but how do you even go about approaching that game uh, with such a counterintuitive meta way? Yeah, so it's all about having a big enough... So you have to threaten to end the game early in order to convince your opponent to prolong the game, right? Because if you... if you This is the problem I ran into with Tyranids, was that I'm trying to actually play the same game as Tyranids that I am with the Space Marine list. Um, I'm trying to do the same thing. I just brought a bigger stick so that people would stop running at me. Um, because if you try to play a prolonged game and your opponent realizes... It is not to my advantage to play a prolonged game. They're going to deploy on the line and sprint at you. And the Space Marine list hits hard enough that it is usually not worth trying to rush it down. I don't want to go for a just strict overextend or run straight at you. But I did find in my, in you know, some testing and me just rolling some stuff out on TTS that if you just disrespectfully run at this army, I will make this a two turn game. Because I, if you just run straight into the open, I will shoot you from the vast the, the back extremity of range out of the counter range, and I will tear your army in half. And so I needed to bring a big enough hammer that people wouldn't want to turn it into a short game. And from there, I as a player am very comfortable with a five-turn drawn-out game, because that's the play style I like the most. That's a great way to look at it. And I think a lot of players right now... Um, are playing in a more aggressive meta where it rewards you for being kind of fast and, and killing your opponent quickly with it, dominating board control. So I imagine a lot of players are not as comfortable in a five-turn situation as you are, since it's like kind of your natural forte. Exactly. I was trying to drag other people into my play style. I wasn't trying to meet them at theirs. And this is also honestly where the army choice of going with something new felt like it was to my advantage, because I noticed this with Tyranids, that in between my tournaments, people were more cautious the first time around. And then once I played people who were like, yeah, I've played a couple of games against Tyranids, they were a little less cautious. And yeah. all Warhammer players share a fear of the unknown. And so everyone on their first rep into Vanguard, no one was, hmm, this is my first rep into Vanguard. What are those guns like? Screw it, full speed ahead. Nobody was like that. And I don't think that's the right answer, but I also didn't want to find out. That's true, right? You don't want to be stat checked because then even if your math says you should be good, if you roll poorly, you know, you're SOL. Yeah, if I have a if my opponent has a good round of saves, I have a bad round of wound rolls, I could still lose a game that mathematically I tabled a minute, and if that happens, the game's over turn two. It only yeah. takes one bad turn of dice if you make it a one turn game. It sounds like a lot of your approach for this army and this whole run you had was above the table, player versus player mentality, um, without even knowing who your opponents were. You kind of meted the players more than the game itself. How did you, what, what is that approach? Yeah, so this was actually a, um, this was me, this is honestly me learning about myself and learning when I have the most fun with Warhammer. Because what I hate the most as a player is when I look at the board state, I recognize the problem, I look at my army, and there isn't a way to solve it. That's the worst feeling. I'm like, oh, my opponent is applying a classic Sprinter Land Raider Redeemer at me. I will counter this by, checks notes, no wait, nothing can kill the Land Raider. Ooh, 
well, we've talked about this before. You've come on the show and you talked about how you've had losses to orc players deploying in the line, waiting to roll for first turn, and just running straight at you. And, and you know, and you've mentioned like this is the worst way to lose, and you're like never again. And it's cool to see you've literally taken that mantra into all the way this far. So what I wanted to do was I, I, I know again I know that everyone is practicing for this event for the top matchup versus the top matchup. Everyone's practicing their CSM versus, you know, a good player's Eldar. Everyone's practicing that. I didn't want to get into a solved board state. I didn't want to bet on my army. I wanted to bet on me. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to take an army that gives me five turns of making decisions, and I'm going to have as many decision points as possible. And if, if I can solve my way out of this, I'm good. Like, if there is a right decision to be made, I'm going to have as much time as possible to find it. And so I, the player, I'm going to have as much option to outplay my opponent as possible. That was the goal. I don't think that the Vanguard hard counters very many things. I don't think it gets hard countered by very many things. There, there's notable exceptions, but there's not many. And so it was, okay, we're going to get an army that lets John make as many decisions as possible. And we're going to see if John can figure out the board state live as many times in a row as possible. We're going to make this game chaotic. We're going to make it weird because I knew I wasn't going to be going into a lot of reps, so I wanted to give myself as many decision points as possible, and I just kind of bet on myself to figure it out. That's such a weird approach to go with it. Most times uh, when you hear aggressive players talking, and they're like, I want to give my opponent as many decisions to make as possible, so they, you know, decision overload. And you're like, I also want to give myself as many decisions as possible, which will add to the threat overload or decision overload. And then across the the spectrum of the tournament, right? This is a whole other thing. You're every time with this army, you have a million decisions to process and there's so many different lines and play you can do with inceptors and centurions and what goes up and what comes down and where and when. And then you have five rounds of a pod and then you took literally the hardest one you can imagine. What was that? Six more games beyond the pod? Seven. Seven. Seven games beyond the pods. So that was a 12 run, 12 game event all basically against super major level winners, then people better than super major winners. And it was just, you know, how did you even do this? Why did you choose this for yourself? Um, that's a great question. You know, with the benefit of hindsight, I don't think I felt alive again for about nine. Like, I, honestly, I think I felt alive again about two weeks after Worlds. It was the first time I just like woke up, had a normal night's sleep and had like a full, yep, I am good. That's because I rolled from the event into holiday season in the U.S. with a lot of driving straight into me moving my apartment. So there was a lot of back-to-back. -back. I was tired. Um, I think that the way that I pulled this off, because I definitely was not planning to make the 12-game run. I was hoping to avoid it, uh, either by playing eight like everyone else or by you know winning the first two of the pods. So I only had to play like 10 or 11 games. Um, but I think the way that I pulled it off was by just playing... Um, a lot of Warhammer and having a lot of the kind of the good habits on muscle memory. And also because I've played a lot of charity events in the past, I've gone to every charity hammer. I have played games at midnight Pacific time, which actually feels like 3 a.m. I've gone from that into two hours of sleep and then do a mock pairing session for this for the charity hammer into two more games, into a three hour nap, into another game. Like I've, I've done the weird hour stuff. I've played a lot of super majors if as long as I know my rules, I can get through it. And I've 12 is the upper limit, but I've got 12 games of Warhammer in me if I need it. That's like a ridiculous amount of Warhammer, John. I mean, I, I am one of the people who has like probably records in terms of Warhammer amounts played over time, but you probably have me beat. And this run is like in more insane because of all the personal life stuff going on around it, surrounding your moving and holidays and whatnot. I mean, I feel for you as a person in that regard, but like it's so impressive to see that you've done this, and then, you know, your met your brain, uh, you know, drains. That's a real thing. You know, people get tired unless you're Richard Siegler, and then you go in and you can play a great game of Warhammer the first few rounds. It's easy. You know, next few rounds, you know, rounds five, six, seven, those are easy too. You do super majors for breakfast. Rounds 10, 11, 12, midnight servo skulls. That's not easy anymore. Like, what is those games like for you? So I don't think that I could have beat someone fresh during those rounds, but that I didn't need to be fresh. I needed to be more fresh than my opponent. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. You yeah. didn't have to be the best person and you just have to be better than your opponent in that game. Yeah. Yeah. Like 
you know, the, the, the one that everyone talks about the most is the the fourth game of Saturday deploy servo skulls starting at like 11 p.m. I was not at 100 percent for that game, but I was at like 90 to 95 because I, I've played plenty of Iron Man events. I have played a lot of Warhammer. I I can go on one night of bad sleep and still have a fully functional day of Warhammer at me. And so I just needed to get through that at a higher speed than my opponent was. And in that case, it was. Was that something you counted on as an advantage for yourself going into this? Or is it just something that, you know, is you have in your back pocket that you have? Definitely a back pocket. It's I don't think of it as an advantage because it's entirely possible that I just play against someone else who is, you know, well rested, didn't doesn't have a hangover, has comfortable shoes, ate good meals, etc. Right. Anyone can do that. I just make sure to avoid it as a disadvantage. Again, if everything gets settled on the table and I lose, that is a very acceptable way for me to lose a game. Or hammer, it happens all the time. That's that's just reality. That's fine. I didn't want, I just needed to make sure I wasn't going to lose a game because I was tired. I just didn't want to be like, yeah, I should have won that game, but I was tired. I, I didn't want the excuses. I wanted it to just be, we got a result of a game of Warhammer, and that's the result. Right. So what was the experience at the World Championships? We'll get through your games and how you played them all through part two. But like, you know, the event itself, what was that like? Um, it was awesome. Um, my favorite event that I've ever been to prior to this point, is the WTC. Um, obviously, this isn't something that a lot of people get to experience, but I like Teams events a lot. I like that atmosphere of going with your friends and seeing your friends and making new friends. The international atmosphere of WTC is unlike anything I have experienced prior, and I very much enjoy that event. And I've, It's been such a privilege that I've been able to attend it twice, and I hope that I can go many more times. Um, WCW brought the closest to that environment I have personally experienced in a singles event. Um, the event itself, very good. GW events are normally great events that are run relatively timely fashion. The terrain is consistent. The missions usually aren't crazy. They're good events. I, I go to as many GW opens as I can. Awesome. Uh, but the players themselves at this event brought an extra level. There was the There's two layers for this. There's the there's the, the small national challenge where you're you're keeping track. Everyone's team is actually listed as their country, which I loved. Uh, obviously, I normally will just submit Art of War for everything. But it was kind of fun being like, nope, we're all on Team USA this weekend. You know, and they're all on Team England, etc. I really enjoyed that aspect. Um, and I loved everyone there. Everyone I played against was such a, you know, such a, a good player, a good sportsman, a great opponent. I, I made so many friends. I got closer to people that I knew, you know, acquaintances became friends, new opponents became friends. People who I already considered friends are now people I want to invite to my wedding. Like it's, it's that level where it's such a great experience that ignoring the actual games of Warhammer is a very fun weekend. And I genuinely regret that I spent so much time playing Warhammer because I didn't get to talk with my friends as much as I would have liked being honest. Yeah. You know, it's that bittersweet ending, you know, that, you know, Having to play Warhammer means less time with your friends. But you know what? A win is a win in that regard. You can't choose wrong there. Yeah, if I'm playing more Warhammer, it's because I'm doing well. Right. Can't complain about that. Well, John, thanks so much for coming on and talking about your world championship lists and experience. I'm sure everyone's eager to hear exactly how you piloted this. There's so many decision points, so the playbook is what you do in the moment. And uh, we're going to figure out exactly what John did in these games to go. What was your final record, John? Um, my final record was 10 wins and two losses. 10 wins and two losses all the way in the final death round versus Manny Chima in the finals of the World Championships of Warhammer. You want to learn how to do that and how John did it, check out AOW40K.com. That is our Patreon. You get access to the part two of this episode along with the 217 other Art of War podcast episodes and our amazing Discord server where you can literally just talk to John. He's right there. Thanks so much for watching, everybody, and we'll catch you next week. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War Down Under and Art of War Unbroken on the competitive 40K network. The Art of War 40K.com.